The FBI warns of armed protests ahead of the inauguration as two members of Congress test positive for COVID after sheltering at the Capitol. Plus, a winner is crowned after a long, strange college football season. Here's what you need to know. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Tuesday, January 12th. I'm Jill Lackner with Carlo Versano. Carlo, good morning. What's the haps in uh, Strong Island today, Wags? It is a... Uh, it was a late night, but um, unfortunately, so it didn't go our way in the college uh, football championship. But that's okay. Uh, we are moving on. There's a always lot of news next to year. This morning, um, Carlo, the Pentagon has authorized as many as fifteen thousand National Guard troops to deploy to Washington ahead of the inauguration on January 20th. The FBI sent a bulletin to law enforcement across the country warning of the possibility of armed protests at all 50 state capitals this weekend and into next week. The Washington Monument is going to be closed through at least the next week because of ongoing threats. Chad Wolf, the acting Homeland Security Secretary who's in charge of protecting the inauguration, has become the third cabinet-level official to quit early. And two Capitol Police officers have been suspended for their actions last week, and at least another dozen are under investigation. Uh, We got an answer to one of the many questions that I had yesterday from the Associated Press that reported that the Capitol Police had the same number of officers uh, working uh, last Wednesday as they did on any other normal day, which is incredible, just an incredible security failure that I think that, uh, you know, we can't we, we can't memory hole here. Um, the Washington Post overnight reporting that the Secret Service has indicated it was investigating an officer who posted comments on Facebook in which she accused lawmakers who formalized Biden's win of treason and echoed uh, the president's conspiracy theories about the election. That That's a, a, a working Secret Service officer who's, who's now been, uh, I I think, been put on leave or at least is being investigated. It's insane that I'm even asking this and I appreciate how insane it is. But are we confident in the security of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris next week at this inauguration? For for many reasons, it seems to me like they should really not be doing this, um, COVID being the big one. Uh, You know, I don't know why Biden isn't just being sworn in on Zoom um, and then, you know, throw a big national party this summer that can sort of double as an inaugural. I mean, it's a great question, Carlo. He said yesterday that he was not nervous about being inaugurated outside. But it's crazy. One thing I want to point out, though, about the FBI warning is that the FBI didn't actually brief the press or release this Mm -hmm. information to the public. Um, Brian Stelter of Reliable Sources says, quote, the FBI should be out front on camera alerting Americans to threats. Instead, ABC News had to obtain the FBI bulletin on its own and then cite info from anonymous sources, and then CNN and other newsrooms confirmed the bulletin's contents later in the day, again saying that armed, armed protests are being planned at all 50 state capitals from January 16th through at least January 20th, um, and at the U.S. Capitol. I mean, this is a very important information. There have been no press conferences. We talked about this yeah. yesterday. And this isn't like we're members of the press and we feel, you know, that we're right, getting right, right. the brush off here. It's, yeah. it's not about that. This is this is the way to speak to the public and to speak to Americans following a domestic terror attack. It's a really it's good just, point. It, it, I, I, it's yeah. crazy. It, it really is. And plus, we we, we now dealt with, with Chad Wolf out. There's now nobody running the show in at the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, to your point yesterday, Jill, who is exactly in charge right now in the federal government? I don't know. I, we, we, we don't know. Um, on that note, House Democrats introduced a single article of impeachment against President Trump for, quote, inciting violence against the government of the United States. The chamber will vote on impeaching the president tomorrow if Vice President Pence doesn't move on the 25th Amendment today. So this was always an unlikely outcome that the, the VP was going to do it, but it's now pretty much dead 
dead on arrival uh, after Pence met with Trump for the first time since the riots and had a, quote, good conversation, according to a senior administration official. By the way, Bill Belichick, the New England Patriots coach, who was supposed to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Trump, he's turned it down. He declined, um, which... Wow. I mean, that's when you're, <laughs> I mean, it's basically the highest civilian honor and he's basically I don't know if that's saying, ever I, happened. I don't want it. Yeah, I don't know if that's ever happened. Uh, but when you're too toxic for a known cheater, Bill Belichick, that's a bad sign. Um, oh, yeah, look, I think uh, on the uh, on the on the on the Pence stuff, I think what this tells you is Republicans are not breaking with the president. They're going to try and ride this out and just sort of keep their heads down for the next eight or nine days. Hope for the best. Um, Clark Cunningham, who's a legal scholar, he wrote in Politico the other day. I thought he made sort of an interesting um, impeachment argument here that the House uh, shouldn't shouldn't use this uh, incite language, and they should instead impeach on a single charge of seditious conspiracy, which is defined as a crime committed whenever two or more people conspire, quote, by force to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States. He was sort of making this argument that that's the, you could nail Trump on that charge easier than the incitement to violence charge, especially because you can be part of a conspiracy even if you don't know or sign on to every crime committed in said conspiracy. I just thought that was sort of an interesting take on this. Um, one quick thing I wanted to mention, I, I can't believe I'm going to be reading from a post that somebody put on Facebook. However, this has stayed with me since I read it. A friend of mine posted this. She said she was borrowing it from a different friend's pa Facebook post. Um, but she talked about the fact that, and I'm going to quote, huge numbers of our population believe in a complete alternate reality, alternate facts as it were. But just as intensely as I believe that they are deluded, they think I am the one who's deluded. Maybe I am. So how can I be confident in my perception? Because it could be quite difficult. But in times of political confusion, particularly when emotions are running high and creating tunnel vision, the presence of Nazis can be an extremely helpful indicator. If I am attending <laughs> a local demonstration or event and I see Nazis, neo-Nazis, miscellaneous Nazis, master race Nazis, or the latest whatever uber mythology Nazis, I figure out which side they are on. And if they are on my side of the demonstration, That's I am on bet. the wrong side. Um I love and that. it's tough to argue moral equivalence when I'm standing next to a Nazi. Look to my right. Is there a guy wearing a six MWE, six million wasn't enough T-shirt? I'm on the wrong side. Look to my left. If that guy is wearing a Camp Auschwitz T-shirt, wrong side. Are speakers being applauded for referring to things that Hitler got right? Wrong side. <laughs> uh, I can always rely on the presence of Nazis as a guiding light through a fog of disinformation. Anyway, it goes on. But I, I love that. I think that that was one of, I mean, again, I read it, it stayed with me. And it's it's one of those things, everyone is convinced that they're seeing this clearly, right? So only, right. there's only one set of facts. I, I actually, my pet peeve is when people say, I'm speaking my truth. No, no, no. Oh, truth is truth, oh, God. right? Yes. Like there are, there are ones, there's one truth, there's one set of facts. There's different perceptions, there's different opinions. Everyone comes with their own experiences and biases, but a fact is a fact. Um, and so I just, I like that, you know, if you look around and you're in the present, Nazis are, are clapping for what you're saying, wrong side. Bad sign. Yes. Well said. Okay. Um, two Congresswomen, Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of Washington have tested positive for COVID. Coleman's been hospitalized. Both Democrats say that they think that they caught the virus from other members of Congress who wouldn't put on masks while they were sheltering at the Capitol. Meanwhile, more states are relaxing vaccine regulations to speed up the rollout. In California, Disneyland and Dodger Stadium will be turned into mass vaccination sites as the U.S. approached a million shots a day. Despite global vaccination campaigns, uh, the World Health Organization's chief scientist is saying that the world, the world will not achieve herd immunity this year. I saw that yesterday, and that was kind of a bummer. Although the WHO has been wrong about so much, it's hard for me to to really take what they say seriously at this point. Um, you know, to, to the to the point about the two Congresswomen, uh, how are these members of Congress going to work together in this co in this coming administration? A good chunk of them supported the mob sent to attack their colleagues, voted to overturn the election results even after that happened. 
which we sort of forget about. And even when they were locking down together, fearing for their lives, some of them couldn't even be bothered to wear a mask. I mean, I, if that was if that was your colleague, how could you work with that person again? I don't it's it's astounding to me. Um on the vaccine, you know, look, we're making progress, but this is still just a mess of bureaucracy and red tape. I wanted to point one thing out that I, I was looking at the um, the process for New York City seniors yesterday. <laughs> it's just, it's a it's a joke, right? Multi step verification for to to sign up online to get your slot. Then you have to answer a fifty one question survey. Upload your insurance card. I mean, these are senior citizens. If you told my, I mean, I love my mother and I'm not trying to, to, my mother would not be able to do that. And she's, you know, she's a, she's a, a smart, capable woman, but she's not, you know, good on the, good on the computer. And I, I it's just, why are we making this so difficult? <sighs> um, but look, this is, you know, look, when the federal government abdicates their responsibility on something that needs a federal centralized approach like the vaccine rollout, this is what you get, right? Every government, every state has their own plan. They're taking their own po – these politicians taking their own political calculations into, uh, you know, into mind when they're working on these things. It, it's, it's, it's just really – it's upsetting. I don't want to get into it because I know that we've just been whining about this all week. But um, the other thing, Jill, is I don't know why we haven't approved the AstraZeneca vaccine yet. Um, this is the safe, the, the you know, the cheap vaccine. It's like two or three dollars a shot. Uh, the UK signed off on it. They're giving this out in England right now. I don't know why are we waiting on this. The FDA made AstraZeneca go back and do a whole new trial. Um, but like, get, get this thing out, guys. I'm glad you mentioned just this vaccine insanity. A friend of mine works for New York City Public Schools, and she got the vaccine yesterday. Um, she told me that the nurses told her that because the vials are only good for a certain amount of time once you open them, because the, the vaccine actually goes bad, that mm -hmm. they wind up spilling out half of the vaccines because there's just not enough people who are, are who fit the criteria right now in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is enough to make your blood boil. We talked about oh, this yeah. yesterday, um, but it's like, okay, at that point, just give it to any, but pull someone in from the street and say, you want the vaccine. I, I mean, I, I don't understand. And, and you're a hundred percent right. So my parents are trying to get it, trying to at least be on some list for something if, when this phase is done. Um, and I spent all yesterday with, with them trying to figure out how they could apply or whatnot and it's it's like it's an insane I couldn't even figure it out. I mean, I'm yeah. not the most tech savvy, but I was having a hard <laughs> time trying to navigate the, the system. Uh, anybody I know who actually was able to sign up told me that they spent all weekend and hours on the computer trying to do it. That's a Ugh. good sign that your system is way too complicated. Um, yeah. We're trying there should be fewer barriers to to get the vaccine. Not uh, not what they're setting up. So it's just I think it's it's objectively a a failed vaccine effort at this point. Yeah. Um, hopefully they'll they'll change. OK, a growing number of big businesses pressing pause on their political donations following the Capitol riots. Morgan Stanley, Amex, Dow Chemical, AT&T, Airbnb have joined Marriott, which we told you about yesterday, saying that they're going to cut ties to Republican lawmakers who voted against certifying the election results. Some others like J.P. Morgan, Citi, Goldman Sachs say that they're going to temporarily stop donations to both Democrats and Republicans. Hallmark is asking for donations that it gave to Senators John Josh Hawley and Roger Marshall to be sent back after those senators objected to the election certification. You know, when you see a statement like Hallmark believes in the peaceful transfer of power, that's when you know things are not going well. Um, but look, Jill, money talks, right? Um, it, so this, you know, like like I said yesterday, this has the potential, I think, to be important. That being said, you know, we're in January of a non-election year, right? So it's very easy to say, oh, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to, we're going to pull all of our political donations right now. Well, there's not really anything to donate to at the moment anyway. So the real, the real question will be to see how long these suspensions last or these companies just doing this to sort of save face, get through a news cycle, and then they'll go back to pumping money to whoever they want in a few months when everybody forgets about this. Um, or are they actually mobilizing against the Republican Party as it's currently you know, constituted? I don't know. Um, I suspect the former, for the record. Also, not for nothing, this is a whole other question, but why are, why are companies allowed to give money to politicians anyway? 
free speech. It falls under the category of free speech. Yes, I know. Right? I mean, this, didn't the Supreme Court rule well, on that, that was a, yeah. a while ago? Yeah, no, I understand why. It's just it, it it's just like it just seems crazy to me. Like, you know, they shouldn't I don't know. It's another it's another podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a topic for another day. Uh, Maggie Haberman, we went while from the New York Times reporting that the thing that upset President Trump the most about all of this, not the riots themselves or the harm done to the GOP, but the fact that the PGA canceled plans to host a golf tournament at one of his courses. Uh, yeah, That's I sort not of, totally I, surprising. I figured that. No, it's not very surprising. Well, if you're one of the two billion people in the world who uses WhatsApp, pay attention to the new privacy policy when it prompts you to accept the upcoming change is going to allow WhatsApp to reserve the right to share your data with the broader Facebook network. So this includes Instagram as well. Even if you don't have Facebook or Instagram accounts, WhatsApp conversations will still be encrypted, but other metadata like your phone's location, contact list, or usage data will be shared with Facebook. This is the reason, by the way, Facebook needs to be broken up. It, uh, not, it doesn't have anything to do with, with Trump or any of that stuff. It has to do with just how – they're just so big at this point. And like I, I'm a great example here, right? I don't have a Facebook. I don't really use Instagram. But I will still be under the watchful eye of Mark Zuckerberg because I do use WhatsApp to communicate with um, – with my friends, uh, especially friends who are abroad, because that's what everybody uses. So I don't really have any uh, options. Um, I think Facebook should be forced to spin off WhatsApp at the very least. And I do suspect that that went from highly unlikely to maybe even odds now with Democrats in control of Washington. I think that this is going to be one of the things that they're going to make a, a real point on in the early days. By the way, I want to mention this, this very quick uh, story on Bloomberg yesterday that I just found hilarious. So Signal, which is another, um, another one of these encrypted apps, only it's not it's not owned by Facebook. So Elon Musk tweeted the other day, use Signal. So what did that do? That ended up having the effect of um, of boosting the market valuation of a medical device company called Signal Advance uh, sixfold. <laughs> I just love these stories when people like mix up stock tickers. Um, so I just thought that was funny. Maybe just me. No, no, no. That's um, I hadn't <laughs> even heard that. That's really funny. OK, turning to sports. It was a heartbreaker for Buckeye fans last night. Nick Saban now has the most college football championships of any head coach in history after Alabama steamrolled Ohio State 52 to 24 to win its sixth national title since 2009. Heisman winner Devonta Smith set seven records in just the first half before he dislocated his finger and had to sit. Did you stay up for the whole thing? I didn't. I stayed up um, till a little bit after halftime. Why are Why are these games on Monday nights? By the way, why is this not on the weekend? Is there a reason for I've, that? I, Monday night, eight no, p.m. kickoff. Come on. It's funny because I asked my husband this. I was like, "What is with the Monday night?" At I mean, this is the first championship that I've ever even really wanted to watch. Um, but yeah. he's like, "That's just how it's always been done." I, but yeah. The strangest college football season in history ends in the most predictable outcome, I think, with Alabama winning it all. So apologies to Mike. Better luck next year, guys. Look, this is this year, it's a wash. It's an asterisk. Everyone who wins a net championship this year, I think, has an asterisk on it, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it's been – it's just – I would like to say it's been a crazy year, but it's, it's, it still continues. Um, okay, <laughs> finally, let's end today with the story of one of the heroes of last week. We wanted to mention this story yesterday, but we ran out of time. So you remember Mr. Rogers famously said that when he was young and saw scary things on TV, his mother would say to him, look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping. Well, among the helpers last Wednesday was Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman. In one of the videos shot amid the chaos, Goodman, who is a black officer who found himself alone with just a baton guarding the Senate chambers, strategically diverted this mob up a staircase where there were reinforcements and away from the room where lawmakers were sheltering. According to a journalist who shot the video, the chamber was secured just one minute after the rioters were baited by Goodman to go in the uh, uh, other direction. Have you seen that video? It's one of the it's, one it, of the most amazing chilling, ones. It's chilling. It's incredible. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a must watch. I and it, it also just shows you something that you and I have been talking about now since this happened, which is you know we we this really could have gone way worse. 
Um, and I think that we were very close to this being way worse than it was. Um, Look, the Capitol Police force as a whole is an utter failure here. There's no question about that. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there, you know, there are specific Capitol Police officers who were were heroes. This guy among them, uh, Officer Goodman. He should be given. If I were Joe Biden, I'd give I'd give Officer Goodman Presidential Medal of Freedom as my first act upon inauguration. And they should put a statue. They should put a statue of him in the Capitol. Right. Replace that Robert E. Lee statue with the statue of uh, Officer Goodman. Um, and Carlo, I know somebody wrote in yesterday asking why, um, and I know I'm just going to p- throw it back to you because you had written this right up, but why we had to mention that the officer was uh, was black. Um, oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. I thought your answer was pretty good. I just wanted you to uh, address that. Yeah, so so somebody wrote into the news because we did the story in the newsletter yesterday. Somebody wrote in. They were just like, I'm curious why you mentioned his race, you know, when there's uh, race doesn't seem to be relevant here. And the and and journalistically, I said, well, his race has become a factor in this story because he was black. And I mean, the mob here, let's face it, was entirely white. Um, And these pictures of him as this lone black man, you know, as this like sentinel guarding the Senate chamber from this riotous white mob, that is that is newsworthy. The images alone, it's hard not to see the race aspect to it, um, at least in my opinion. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you for the clarification. And I, I sure. agree with you there. Um, OK, everybody, we're going to leave it there for now. That's what you need to know for Tuesday, January 12th. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>